There we go. Welcome YouTube, amen? I'm gonna be using this, so, I, so I'm gonna try not to blow anybody's ears off, <laughs> amen? I just thank God for each and every one of you who are here. We're gonna be doing a two week sermon series and um, I think that this is, this is gonna be an absolute blessing for, uh, for each and every one of you who are here this week and next week. I think you want to really going to avail yourself for next week as well. Amen. And then after this sermon series, we're going to be going on relationships. So you might want to avail yourself for that also. Uh, we started and we did talk about relationships at the end of the year. Last year we talked about Jane in the, in the book of James. There's something, I'm, something a little more that I want to bring even out of that particular passage of scripture that I think is really relevant for today for us and for the goal that God has for the church and for the goal that God has for each and every one of us individually. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to get into your word. We believe, Lord God, that you're going to do a mighty work in each and every one of our hearts. Allow your word to go in and to germinate in each and every one of us, Lord God, and to grow and bring forth fruit for your glory, for your honor, and for your name's sake. In Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk to you today about unwanted stretch. An unwanted stretch. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We're going to start, and if you have your Bibles, and I know you have your Bible, Jessica, because I saw that new Bible cover. <laughs> Amen. So you can open up to 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 8, and if you're like the rest of us, you can either open up in your device it's good to open up in a paper Bible, and here's the reason why, because you want to get to know that word yourself. Sometimes there might be a day when the power goes off and you're not able to charge this thing. Okay? So this thing might be rendered useless at one point or another. But let me tell you what, the paper Bible will never be rendered useless. And in fact, it was once said that a Bible, a, a person whose Bible is falling apart leads to a life that's not. Amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. So we're going to look at unwanted stretch. We're going, to re we're going to read a very, actually quite a long passage of scripture uh, today. We'll only be three and a half hours. No, I'm, I'm, only, I'm only kidding. Sue's <laughs> <Hi, thank you. laughs> going to be asleep by then because she works overnight. We're just grateful to have her here now. But on the screen, you're going to have it up. Second Kings starting in chapter 4 and looking at verse... Eight. We're going to be reading verse 8 to verse, yes, 38. Amen. One day, Elisha passed through Shunem. A leading lady of the town talked him into stopping for a meal. And when it became his custom, whenever he passed through, he stopped by for a meal. I'm certain, said the woman to her husband, that this man who stops by with us all the time as a holy man of God. Why don't we add on a small room upstairs and furnish it with a bed and desk, a chair and a lamp, so that when he comes by, he can stay with us. That's the first bed and breakfast, Airbnb. And so it happened that next time Elisha came by, he went to the room and laid down for a nap. Then he said to his servant Gehazi, tell the Shunammite woman, I want to see her. He called her and she came to him. Through Gehazi, Elijah said, you've gone far beyond the call of duty in taking care of us. What can we do for you? Do you have a request we can bring to the king or to the commander of the army? She replied, nothing. I'm secure and I'm satisfied my family. Elisha conferred with Gehazi. There's got to be something we can do for her. But what? And Gehazi says, well, she has no son. He probably looked it up on Facebook and Instagram and said, there's no child there. <laughs> and her husband's an old man. Call her in, Elisha said. He called her and she stood at the door open. And Elisha said to her, this time next year you're going to be nursing an infant son. Oh, my master, oh, holy man, she said, don't play games with me, teasing me with such fantasies. The woman conceived a year later, as Elijah had said, she had a son. The child grew up, 
One day he went with his father who was working with the harvest hands, complaining, my head, my head. This father ordered the servant, carry him to his mother. See, even back then, the mother was for everything. The servant took him in his arm and carried him to his mother. He laid, hold, he laid on her lap until noon and died. She took him up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, shut him in alone and left. She then called her husband, get me a servant and a donkey so I can go to the holy man. I'll be there as soon as I can. But why today? It's neither new moon nor Sabbath. She said, don't ask the questions. I need to go right now. You just need to trust me. Hallelujah. She went ahead and saddled the donkey, ordering her servant, take the lead. Go as fast as you can. I'll tell you if you're going too fast. And so off she went. She came to the holy man at Mount Carmel. The holy man spotted her while she was still a long way off. Said to, her, said to his servant Gehazi, Look out there, why the Shunammite woman. Quickly now, ask her, is something wrong? Are you, are you all right? Your husband, your child. She said, everything is fine. She lied. But when she reached the holy man at, at the mountain, she threw herself at his feet and held tightly to him. Gehazi came up to pull her away, but the holy man said, leave her alone. Can't you see that she's in distress? But God hasn't let me in. I'm completely in the dark. She spoke up. Didn't I, did I ask for a son, Master? Didn't I tell you, don't tease me with false hopes? He ordered Gehazi, don't, don't lose a minute. Grab my staff and run as fast as you can. If you meet anyone, don't even take time to greet him. And if anyone greets you, don't even answer. Lay my staff across the boy's face. The boy's mother said, as sure as God lives, and you live, you're not leaving me behind. And so Gehazi let her take the lead and followed behind. But Gehazi arrived first and laid the staff across the boy's face. But there was no sound, no sign of life. Gehazi went back to meet Elijah and said, the boy hasn't stirred. Elisha entered the house and found the boy stretched out on the bed dead. He went into the room and locked the door. Just two of them in the room and prayed to God. He then got into the bed with the boy and covered him with his body, mouth to mouth, eyes on eyes, hands on hands. As he was stretched out over him like that, the boy's body became warm. Elisha got up and paced back and forth in the room. Then he went back and stretched himself upon the boy again. The boy started sneezing. Seven times he sneezed. And he opened his eyes. He called Gehazi and said, Get the Shunammite woman in here. He called her and she came in. Elisha said, Embrace your son. She fell at Elisha's feet, face to the ground in reverend awe. Then she embraced her son and went out with him. Wow. Man, that's good. That enough preaches, if you heard that well. There's a whole lot here, but we don't have time for everything that's here. But what we want to do today is we want to, we want to concentrate on verse 28. We want to concentrate on verse 28. Because when Elisha, when she got to Elisha after her baby boy was dead, she asked a very powerful question that many of us can only ask when we're stretched. She asked the question, did I ask for a son? Master, didn't I tell you don't tease me with falsehoods? Here's the question. I didn't even ask for this. I didn't even ask for this. I remember when, I, when we first, when we were in Ozone Park, uh, I was trying to get into shape. Okay, I, I come to terms that oblong is now a shape. 
one of each beach body whale can come on board on the sea anytime. But I wanted to get into shape. I remember seeing people in the TV shows and movies, and I said, you know what, I'm gonna do that. So I went and I got a I, I got a trainer. I was very excited about getting the trainer. I'm like, there you go, here you go, the new rock. You know, that, that's gonna be me. So I said, that's what I want. I want my body ripped. And then the guy came in, and uh, so Louise would probably remember this. I went one time, the guy came in and he came in with two things, two bands. Like, what is this for? He said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to stretch the band out, and I'm gonna take, I want you to take these light weights, and I want you to concentrate on form. So I was lifting those, and, and I'm like, what is this? This is child's play, 15 pounds? Give me a break. I think the milk was heavier than that. But once I stretched that band out, and said, now you gotta keep the tension. Once I stretched that band out and I started lifting those weights, it was like, wow! It wasn't like 15 pounds anymore. It was like 115 pounds after the fact. And he made me do a whole lot of reps with that. And then he said, okay, now I want you to put this one, a small one also, on your legs. Now I want you to do squats. I couldn't believe it. It felt like they were putting acid on my legs. Every single one of my muscles. The next day I practically could walk. Oh, and he, and, and he said, okay, you're going to come back for the workout? And I said, oh, yeah, but I don't want those bands. No, 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 no. You're not going to get me those bands and everything like that. I'm not Richard Simmons or whatnot. And, uh, and he said, no bands, no workout. And I said, what do you mean? What are you talking about? I want to be ripped and everything like that. Why don't we do the have free weights and everything like that, heavy like that? He said to me, listen to me. When you hired me, you said you were committed to look like that. But the problem was, with, not with him, but the problem was with me. Because I was committed to a picture, but I wasn't committed to a process. And, the pro and what we have to do is we have to be committed to the process in order for God to do a work in and through our hearts and lives. And whenever we're stretched, the th the thing we always come up with, the statement we always say is, I never wrote, I never signed up for this. I didn't want this. This isn't something that I wanted. I didn't want this stretching. In, I wanted the results. I wanted the end result. I wanted the product, but I didn't want the process to go through it. And in order to get to that particular place, there has to always be a stretching in your life. And it might not always be Welcome. See, the problem is, and I realize this even in my Christian walk, we want a miracle because we, want, because we read about it in the Bible. But we don't want to be in a situation that warrants a miracle. In order for a miracle to happen, there has to be a, something that happens beyond hope and beyond our capability. Does anybody want that? We want a miracle but we, want, we don't want the situation that's beyond our capability. We always want to have a semblance of control. But here's the thing, if God's gonna raise us into the people, if God wants to bring revival in and through our lives, we have to learn to trust him beyond our capability. And that's always an unwanted stress. Here's the thing I learned also. The bigger the problem, the bigger the opportunity for a miracle. The bigger the obstacle, the bigger the moment for God to shine through. Let me tell you, we always praise and thank God for the resurrection. But the resurrection is powerful because of the reality of death. If death wasn't a reality, if death wasn't imminent, the resurrection wouldn't have power. There wouldn't be hope in the resurrection. But there's hope in the resurrection because there's the reality of death. And that's what's at the forefront, forefront of this text. God used his prophet Elijah to bring a boy who was dead back to life. And in the miracle, and, and all of all the miracles that are in the Bible, you could think of them, there are many of them. Blind eyes see, deaf ears hear, the lame start to walk. 
Jesus walks on water, 5,000 are, are fed, even more. In, in fact, many Bible scholars say up to 15,000 are fed, including women and children. Of all the things, even Jesus put a, put a tax pin inside a fish. How incredible is that? But when you look at this, this miracle is taking it to a whole other level. Death is one of those things that cannot be undone. And that's the reason why this is so, a miracle like no other. Because you could be hungry, but once you eat, that hunger is over. You could be blind, but once you see, that miracle is done. But once you die, there's a finality there. There is no coming back. There's certain things that are beyond capability. But I thank God that we have a God who brings life out of dead things. He's able to bring life, he's able to bring life back to a dead marriage. He's able to bring life back to a dead relationship. He's able to bring life back into dead situations and financial, whether it's financial, emotional, or even physical situations. See, he is the resurrection. Now, I love that the resurrection occurs in this passage, but I want to look at something that happens even before this particular miracle that I think we need to have because if God, if we want God to do miracles in our lives and we said yes, we got to prepare our hearts for the miracles. If we want a if we want that revival that we're praying for in this church, we have to prepare our hearts for it because there's a cost. I want to start with this. The first thing is everything started with an invitation. An invitation started everything in this particular passage of scripture. In so many words, watch this. She said, Elisha, we'd love for you to come over because I'm cooking something special. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time you invited somebody over to your home? I know so many times that, oh, wow, the place is a mess and this and that and the other thing. If they're coming to see the mess, they can, they can go to the junkyard. They don't care about the mess. They care about you. <laughs> and anyway, the last person that walked on water was, was crucified. So if, you, if you're thinking you're going to be perfect, it's not going to happen. Neither you nor I. But when was the last time you opened up, opened up and had intimate fellowship with friends and loved ones in your home? That's an amazing thing. When was the last time you invited someone, even here to the church, to have fellowship? Ultimately, unless my preaching is that bad. <laughs> but I'm not saying that. Ultimately, the fact of the matter is this. When we invite people, there's power in an invitation. I remember there was once a pastor that was in Dallas, Texas, and he started a little, he started a little church and it was right next to a place that was owned by Mark Cuban, the owner of the Dallas uh, Mavericks and one of the Shark Tank people. Yeah. Okay, he was one of the guys on Shark Tank that everybody hates. Uh, but, uh, you know, what happened was he said, you know, he's actually, the, the pastor sent out an invitation to Mark Cuban. Do you know Mark Cuban actually came to his church, to the church? Can you believe that? That doesn't happen without an invitation. And sometimes we start to think that people's lives are so busy and so out of touch and so that they, that they have everything in, in order. We don't know what's happening in somebody's life. No matter how high and mighty they are or no matter how low they are. They could look all gangster and everything. They could walk around all funny and everything. They could walk around drunk and you, we don't know what's happening in their heart. We don't know the Christ of their heart. That's why an invitation is so powerful. Because you never know when somebody's hurting. And sometimes all somebody needs is an invitation to come into fellowship. And they meet God, they're in fellowship with you, and life starts to change. Amen? So an invitation is so very important. You know, you never know. Let me ask you. What turned, what turned fishermen into disciples? An invitation. Jesus said, come, all you who are hungry and thirsty. Come to me. It was an invitation. And that's what this lady had. She had, she was very welcoming. She was an in, she invited him in. 
So the Shunammite woman said to her husband, guess who's coming to dinner? She answered, Elisha. And that happened because of an invitation. You never know. The second thing is, we don't know how many times he's been over. But at some point, that invitation turned into a perception. It turned into a perception. She says she perceived that he was a holy man. It was this perception that led her to realize that this was a special moment. Right now, we're fasting and praying. Well, I am Louise's fasting certain things, and I'm fasting also so. I don't eat. There's nothing wrong with your food. Amen. It's something that we do every year in January. We fast and we pray and we believe God. But this perception led to a particular moment that was so special. One of the things that we need to pray for is the ability to discern moments. Moments can change the trajectory of your life. There are some times where you can see certain things and respond to certain things in a particular way that can change the whole trajectory of your life. Somebody just happened to be there and you respond in a way of kindness. You respond to from somebody's being wicked to you and you're being kind to them. Somebody sees that and says, that's the man I want to hire. Mm -hmm. That's the woman I want watching my children. Somebody comes and sees it, and it changes the trajectory of your life. Relationships might be built up at the time. But we need to have discernment to recognize and to redeem first of the time and to recognize the moment. Hallelujah. There are some things that you'll never perceive until you're connected with God. If you're somebody who's just walking in the natural and in the flesh, you may not have the discernment to be able to see it. Look at what it says in Isaiah. I have it up on the screen. Isaiah 43, 19. Oh, I realized I put it too high. <laughs> Forget about what's happened. Don't keep going over old history. Mm. Be alert. Be present. I'm about to do something brand new. This is God speaking. It's bursting out. Don't you see it? There it is. I'm making a road through the desert and rivers in the badlands. He says these words in another passage of scripture, in another translation, says, do you not perceive it? Can't you see it? Is what he's saying. We need to be awake and sober. Why? Because we need to be able to see and discern the moments and the times that we're living in. The opportunities that we have to be able to relate to people and to show Christ. That's one of the reasons we're fasting right now. We're seeking his face. We're because we don't want to miss an important moment, we need his leading more now than ever before. The third thing we're going to look at, or the third thing, she goes from an invitation to a perception, and now she has an action. See, everything progresses in a particular way. And we need to progress in a particular way according to this passage of Scripture. Verse 10, the Bible says, Why don't we add on a small room upstairs, and furnish it with a bed and desk, chair and lamp, so that when he comes by, he can stay with us. See, that was an action. Did they have to do that? No. Did they have to take out that expense upon themselves? No. Did they know whether he would come by or not? Again, no. But they made a preparation. They prepared for the presence of the man of God. They prepared for his presence and for his servant Gehazi. This was an action, and it's important to put an action into what you're believing for. If you're believing for something, you have to start to put it into action. If you believe God for a good job, sometimes it takes going to a particular college or a school for it. Sometimes it takes going into that, that temp agency that you've been walking by or see all the time but don't know. She had a one-story house. I had this is interesting. She had a one-story house, but now she went to build a second story. And it's just an interesting thought. Now, I'm just thinking this in conjecture. This is not necessarily uh, proper theology, but I believe that this, is, this applies to each and every one of our lives. I wonder how many people are caught in their one story. 
I wonder how many people are caught in the story of their past. In the story of how things always have been. The one story of failure. All my friends were able to have children and I'm not. She could have very easily gone to that and said, well, you know, so I'm going to be in despair. I'm going to live alone. Because many people who are, who are in despair or in this particular place isolate themselves and crawl away. This woman didn't. She took an action and she went and she built a second story in her home. She went to Home Depot because I worked there. She went to Home Depot and she bought wood and lumber. Hallelujah. And she built a second story. Listen to me. Because she took the initiative to bless the man of God, he was compelled to give her a blessing. How do you know that? Verse 13 says, through Gehazi, Elisha said, you've gone far beyond the call of duty in taking care of us. What can we do for you? Do you have a request we can bring to the king or to the commander of the army? She replied, nothing. I'm secure and satisfied in my family. I wonder. I wonder if she was settling because it was too painful to believe again. See, because she didn't have children, and it was such an indictment not to have children. I'm wondering how many times she cried in the middle of the night, wondering, God, can I have children? Can I have significance in my life? That's the most important call. Listen to me. If you're a mom in this place, there is not a more important call in life. To be that mom to that child is the most important thing you can be. Forget about retail, forget about management, forget about other things. If you are a mom, that is the most important thing that you can be. You have a job, amen, glory to God for that. But number one is here, being a good mom. And, being, and also if you're a wife, being a good wife. Hallelujah. And a spiritual mom as well. <laughs> Dr. Martin Luther King, who we're celebrating this month, and even now, I think it's his birthday now. It's, oh, tomorrow. We celebrate it tomorrow. <laughs> Dr. Martin Luther King said the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but actually where you stand in moments of challenge and controversy. That's the making of a good man. And Elisha conferred with Gehazi. There's got to be something that we can do for her. But what? Gehazi said, well, she has no son, and her husband is an old man. Yes. Call her in. And Elisha called her, and she stood at the open door. And Elisha said to her, this time next year, you're going to be nursing an infant son. Let me tell you something that's important over here that can go right past us. He didn't say you'll be pregnant. See, because pregnancy doesn't guarantee that everything's going to follow through. Mm -hmm. Especially in that day and age. More people died in childbearing than anything else in those days. So he didn't say you're going to get pregnant. Today, it'll be different. Because more times than not, nothing happens if you, if you, you know, when you get pregnant, you'll have, you more times than not have the child. At least from what I know. He said he'll be nursing a baby boy. The promise of God will never leave you fruitless. The fourth thing that we have is she went from an invitation to a perception to an action and now to an Im Im imagination. You know, we think of imagination it has a bad, you know, it has a bad connotation today because we think of imagination in terms of something that's not true or real. But she said this in scripture. Oh, my master, oh, holy man, she said, don't play games with me, teasing me with such, what? Fantasies. The woman conceived a year later, just as Elijah had said, and she had a son. So what does that have to do with imagination? It has everything to do with imagination. If you don't have vision, you start to lose hope. And when you start to lose hope, you stop asking. You stop praying. So actually, if you think about that, imagination or vision 
is directly correlated and connected to asking in prayer. When you stop having a vision, and a vision is what? An image. is seeing something. Getting a vision from God. We talked about it last week. When you start to see a particular vision or a place where God wants you to be, if you don't have that anymore, you're not going to start praying. You're not going to have a direction to pray. Where do you see that in Scripture? Well, I'm glad you asked. One of the most famous Scriptures is this, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or what? Imagine. He may not say it for you. According to his power that is at work within us. Imagine. We need to be able to see in order to ask. Asking and imagining are connected in the scripture. And we stop asking because we don't want to get our hopes up. Maybe she was in that particular place. Oh, I'm fine. I'm cool. Me and my family, we're good. We're good. She didn't want to put herself in a place of vulnerability. She didn't want to put her place in a place where she can get hurt. Or get close enough to get hurt. Verse 18 and 19 says, The child grew up, and one day he went with his father, who was working with the harvest, and he, and he complained, My head, my head. His father ordered a servant carry him to his mother, and the servant took him in his arms and carried him to his mother. And he laid hold, he laid on her lap until noon. And he died. See, all of a sudden she's holding a lifeless little boy. And she went from fulfilled promise to holding a lifeless child. That is a stretch if I've ever seen it. Because you think the promise came to pass, and all of a sudden there comes a hardship with it. I didn't ask for this, God. How many things do we have in our lives that we get? And then all of a sudden things seem to fall apart. God, I didn't even ask for that. And sometimes it's not even the bad things that happen. It's the fulfillment of God and then all of a sudden the fruitlessness starts to come. And it seems like, God, what happened? At that moment, when the, that's when the thought crossed her mind. I didn't ask for this. The fifth and the final thing is she went from imagination to devastation. Devastation. She was in a place of devastation when she was broken. Devastation is not the same as disappointment. Disappointment is I hope for it and it didn't come to pass. Devastation is it came to pass and I lost it. That's entirely different. Look at verse 22 to 26. The Bible says, She then called her husband, Get me a servant and a donkey so I can go to the holy man. I'll be back as soon as I can. But why today? This isn't a holy day. It's neither new moon nor, have, nor Sabbath. She said, Don't ask questions. I need to go right now. Trust me. She went ahead and saddled the donkey, ordering her servant, Take the lead and go as fast as you can. I'll tell you if you're going too fast. And so off she went. She came to the holy man at Mount Carmel. And the holy man, spotting her while she was still a long way off, said to, her, said to his servant Gehazi, Look out there, wife, the Shunammite woman. Quickly now, ask her, is something wrong? Are you all right? Is your husband your child? Is everything fine? <coughs> Let me say this. It matters what you say, what story you tell in the midst of devastation. Many of us are going to be there. If you don't, if you haven't been there, just live a little longer. Somehow or another, it does happen. Listen, and I'm not speaking it over your life. I'm not hoping it upon you. No, please don't get the wrong idea. I want blessings upon you like nobody's business. But it happens. And God never lost control. He never failed. I had a friend. I wanted to put his picture up, but I couldn't find it. His name was George Beeler. Another George. George Beeler was one of my best friends. And if you're watching this, Pastor Gilbert, you might remember this story. A man from when we went to Russia went with George, and he was on fire for God. This is a man that loved the Lord with every fabric. I mean, we had such a wonderful group that went to Russia. 
who's uh, Pastor Gilbert, George, myself, David Rawls, Brother Rich Howard. I remember when we went to, and David, and, and also George Velasquez, two Georges. You can't have one, you have to have two Georges. And then we have King George here now. <laughs> Amen. But King George ain't going nowhere <laughs> for a long time to pray, except, for, except, except if when Jesus comes back. But George was such an on fire man. And then cancer came. He, went, he moved to California. And cancer came upon him. He was a greeter at Walmart. Cancer came upon him. And I remember hearing from his uh, sons and daughters. He had two daughters, one, well, actually one daughter and two sons. Amazing. That he was in the hospital, and when he was in the hospital, barely able to walk, he was preaching the gospel and laying hands on people. Bringing joy. This is a man in the last stages of cancer. Not many people, when they're dying, care about somebody else. We knew about this and we prayed so urgently for George. George was, at that time, George was my best friend. We were the closest. We would have all night prayer meeting. We would have praise and worship. We'd gone around the world preaching the gospel. We'd gone bringing hope to people. If somebody was homeless, we'd gone and got them clothed and got food for people. We did everything that we did. This man had a heart for God. And we prayed for him. And we desired healing for him. But it didn't come to pass. It didn't come to pass. That, con that, con that cancer consequently took his life. He told the story of Jesus from the very last breath that he had. See, in devastation, you have to run and cleave to the one who gave the promise. It's so easy that when you get disappointed, when something that could be disappointing happens in your life, it's so easy to try to just get involved in your emotions. But here's the thing. We have to cleave to what we know is the truth. The one who gave the promise. Look at what verse 27 says. But when <coughs> the Shunammite woman, her child died, she could have said, forget about God. But, when she, but she made up a story to Gehazi. When she reached a holy man at the mountain, she threw herself at his feet and held tightly to him. She cleaved to what she knew was true. Gehazi came up to pull her away, but the holy man said, leave her alone. Can't you see? She's in distress. But God hasn't let me in on why. I'm completely dark. Ah, oh my. This is George. Oh my goodness. I wish I could show it on the screen. I wish I could show it on the screen. Oh my. This is this is a powerful man of God. Okay. We're gonna take a look later. I want you to see George. George is my my buddy. She brought him back to the place where it all started. She didn't just let go. She didn't just run away. Verse 32 and, 32 and 35, I'm going to start this. She entered the house and found the boy stretched out on the bed. That Elisha did. He went into the room and locked the door. What happened was, uh, I don't know why God didn't heal my friend George. I don't know why what you're facing might not have changed. I don't know why you might be in the same situation that you're in. Some things we just don't know. I don't know why Elisha sent Gehazi ahead with his staff to put, to put it on the boy and it didn't work. He's a man of God. I don't know why when Elisha stretched himself over the boy the first time, it didn't work. He was pacing back and forth and praying. It didn't work. I didn't know. But what I do know is that when we don't understand what's going on, we need to cleave to what we do know. This woman threw herself at his feet and held tightly to him. 
When nothing makes sense, we need to hold on to a savior who came to earth and stretched himself out on the cross to defeat death once and for all. We need to hold on to the one who gives us true hope, regardless of what's happening around us. When you're being stretched to a degree that you don't want, we need to hold on to Jesus Christ. And he promises victory. And we thank him for that. In Jesus' name, will you stand? Hallelujah. <clears throat> Glory to God. Glory to God. I'm going to pray for you. Precious Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord God. We thank you that you give us hope. We thank you that even though we don't understand it all, you're able to take us and to bring us to a place of victory. Victory might not happen the way we see fit in this side of eternity, but we trust the one who holds us. And we trust the process of what you're bringing us through to make us holy, because that's your promise. Lord, I ask that you grant us strength and grace for now and for the future, that we may be a testimony for your glory, that we may cleave on to you even when things don't seem to make sense. And we thank you and give you all the glory, the praise, and the honor. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Glory to God. Hallelujah. I want to show that picture. Oh, I'm tripping. I'm tripping on video.